the ratio is probably water to the combined cement ash. Right. Mm -hmm. That is what you're doing is you're making a new cement yeah. by mixing ash in. This semester I'm co-teaching a class uh, that we call D-Lab Schools and we're focusing on the design of better schools at lower cost if we can reduce the cost of of a standard government school, then they can build more schools and lift more families out of poverty through education. We're focusing on Cambodia, where a brutal regime in the 1970s basically wiped out an educated class in Cambodia educational materials, and so there's a tremendous need for better schools and for learning materials. So it's almost certain that the ash in Cambodia is coarser than this. <laughs> yes. But this is what's going to make better concrete at lower cost and going to help build more schools. You know, this class is about technology and implementation of technology, but fundamentally it, it is about public service. It's about how do you bring your MIT education to bear on vital problems facing the world and how do you make the world better one MIT class at a time. And this ethos of public service is one that's manifested itself in many different ways over the first 150 years of MIT. When William Barton Rogers founds MIT, he has a wonderful vision for a new kind of educational institution. It's based on the principle that the laboratory is as important as the lecture hall. Safe drinking water, it's one of the great luxuries here in the United States. And the person we owe much of that to is Ellen Swallow Richards. She was the first woman to graduate from MIT. She taught sanitary chemistry, but what she's most famous for is a phenomenal study of the quality of water in the state of Massachusetts. She collected some 20,000 samples carefully documenting the results, she transformed water quality standards for the nation. Within a year, Austrian Archduke Franz Ferdinand was shot down, and the greatest war the world had known exploded in Europe. The United States entered World War I quite a bit later than most of our European allies, but when it entered the war, it was with great gusto. And that was true right here at MIT as well. Uh, MIT functioned primarily as a humongous training ground. There were, first and foremost, a need for pilots. Remember, aircraft were actually quite a new technology at that time. Uh, and MIT jumped into the lead in training aviators. And it turned out even more important than pilots were mechanics, engineers, to design, improve, and maintain those aircraft. So here's a great photo of uh, three MIT students with some early radio equipment. This, I think, dates from around 1918. This one's one of my favorites. It shows a tank rolling down Arlington Street. It says, first American tank made in technology. Here we see a number of fresh officers. MIT had run a massive officer training program during the First World War. One of the alumni from that program composed a song called the Flight Song. It says, Flight A, Flight A, here at the Institute, studying aeronautics under Mac or corking loot. And when we get to the Kiel Canal, we'll do the job up neat. Oh, Hans, oh, Fritz, there'll be no German fleet. Alas, Ensign McClellan, who composed that song, uh, perished himself in an airplane accident in France uh, early in 1918. December 7th, 1941, a day of infamy. Even as Japanese diplomats were conferring with Secretary of State Hull on peace measures, Nipponese planes were swooping down on Pearl Harbor. The battleship Arizona was completely destroyed and four others severely damaged. Just over 70 years ago, it was September 19th, 1940, there was a top secret meeting in Washington, D.C. It was actually in a hotel room. And there were a few people in attendance, including MIT's president, Carl Compton, uh, and crucially, a British delegation as well, headed by Sir Henry Tizard. The British came carrying this. It looked very bizarre, uh, hard to imagine such amazing consequences coming from such a tiny little device. It was called a cavity magnetron. It might not look like much, but to the people who received it that night, they came to call it the gift of the gods. 
with the United Kingdom deep in the throes of the Second World War, there were simply no resources there to develop this further for genuine wartime use. And so there was a deal being forged that the British team would give this device to their American colleagues in exchange for a full tilt effort to develop centimeter wavelength, short, short wavelength radar with the hopes that that would in fact turn the tide of the war. It was able to produce amazing output of power and it meant that one could actually see things that were much, much tinier. They could be used to detect not just massive hulking things like aircraft, but in fact tiny little features like periscopes from the perilous German U-boats, the submarines. MIT was gearing up in a very major way for national defense. One of the largest efforts would become known as the Radiation Laboratory, or the Rad Lab for short. It became the allied headquarters for the entire effort in radar. It just massively and almost overnight transformed MIT, transformed the relationship of science, technology, and the military, and changed uh, forever what we would know as science in the service of the state. MIT's tradition of national service continues to this day, and this drive that I'm doing now to the airport to catch the airline shuttle to Washington, D.C. is one that I do not infrequently as part of my job, and it's a long tradition at MIT. MIT faculty have served as presidential science advisors, as secretaries of the Air Force, as heads of the National Science Foundation, and have taken advisory roles in any number of different agencies over the years, and it's a proud tradition at MIT, and the Institute supports it as part of our work. In the 1930s, an MIT professor named Charles Stark Draper began putting scientific instruments into the cockpits of aircraft and developed a lot of the basic technology of what's now called instrument flight. During the Second World War, Draper's laboratory, called the Instrumentation Lab, grew very, very large, taking techniques they had applied for instrument flying to control gunfire aboard Navy ships and help the U.S. Navy fight off the kamikaze threat. During the Cold War, a lot of those techniques developed into what's known as inertial guidance, which is the ability to navigate by using gyroscopes and accelerometers. And in the 60s, Draper and his instrumentation lab really built the guidance systems and the computers that controlled the Apollo missions to the moon. Indeed, the very software that literally flew the lunar landings along with Neil Armstrong was written and developed here at MIT by members of Draper's instrumentation lab. They asked me if I could make equipment that would take them to the moon and back, and I said, yes, I could. Well, they said, how would I guarantee this? And I said I would go along and run it myself. One of the lasting contributions of Apollo was that picture that was sent back that Christmas Eve of Earthrise over the moon's horizon. Here was this blue planet with white clouds looking very fragile, and indeed it is. Many people feel that was the beginning of the environmental movement. So while Apollo did reach out and take us on a small step towards the stars, it also had us look back and realize we really had to devote a lot of attention to protecting and preserving planet Earth. I watched the Apollo 11 landing in my den with my family when I was five years old. I remember very distinctly. And so it really inspired me to dream and eventually to become an aerospace engineer and professor at MIT. The current students that I have the pleasure to teach have some of the hardest challenges in front of them in terms of energy, in terms of climate change, in terms of exploration. The great news is that they have passion, they will rise to the occasion, they have all of the skills. I think we all came to MIT because we knew that it was a place where we can make a big difference and we all want to make an impact in our field and solving some of those really tough challenges are the things that get us up in the morning. The future generation, it has its Apollo moment right now. So I really see the symbiosis between the great challenges of the world and what MIT can bring to help solve and contribute to those great problems. One of the things I think is great about MIT is that it's a place that believes in its students and believes that their students will do great work before they graduate as well as after. We're going to Cambodia to 
implement some of the ideas that students have worked so hard this semester to develop. So that's the ultimate example of going from the classroom directly into real world applications. When we were in Cambodia, we had a chance to make some test beams out of concrete that incorporated the rice husk ash we had found at local rice mills. So we loaded concrete beams with soil bricks in a traditional three-point bending test like you might perform in your classes at MIT. Huh. Okay. The construction supervisor was actually really impressed with how strong the mortar was when he chipped into it. Not only were we able to test out some of our research, but we also got to do something really important for the community. 15 years ago, I was a graduate student who thought that it would be nice if MIT did a little more international development. And now literally thousands of students are going into the field and they're really making a great difference in the world. This is a generation that has a will to citizenship, a passion for solving problems. When they discover a problem, I mean, no sooner have they understood it's a problem, they've rolled up their sleeves to get to work. I come to call this generation, Generation Why Not? They are undaunted by the kinds of challenges that we can, you know, list, you know, why the world is such a tough place now. They, they're just out there to make the world a better place. And I love this idea that they emerge as someone who has a passion, but also compassion. Welcome to our impromptu English class. Three, Three four, four, five. Five. Good job. <laughs> Coming here to MIT and working with the Public Service Center and having these opportunities to be exposed to the world around us and the need around us has really, um, yeah, I mean it's entrenched in me and I feel like I wouldn't be able to shake it off even if I wanted to. And this is not a new idea, the notion that we are in service to the world through our work. So. That mission of MIT, the notion of public service as part of our work as professors, as students, uh, runs through the Institute today and is a big part of what makes MIT what it is. Massachusetts Institute of Technology.